The date of this photograph is 1916. On the left, Francis Densmore, an ethnologist operating what was probably the best recording machine available 80 years ago. On the right, Mountain Chief, a Blackfoot Indian from Montana, here recording ancient tribal music or perhaps stories. A reminder that Native American literature was, for the most part, an oral literature, and much of it survives today only because of dedicated efforts to capture it in permanent form before it died out forever. Welcome to English 3350, a survey of American literature before the Civil War. We're in Studio One today at the MD Anderson Library on the main campus of the University of Houston. I'm Barry Wood, and today we're continuing our look at the Native Americans and specifically looking at their oral narrative literature. We have an account set down in 1850 by Eli Parker of the Iroquois Confederacy and how it was uh, originally formed. It's in the Heath Anthology, the assigned text for the course, starting on page 59. It's a little more than three pages in length, just one of many accounts that exist, all with the same basic characters. One is Tadodaho, an evil despotic Indian of the Onondaga tribe who is terrorizing the other tribes in the region, uh, including, of course, at that time, the, uh, the, uh, the four other tribes of, of the Iroquois. The other is De Kanawida. In this account, he too is an Onondaga uh, Indian of great wisdom. Eventually, in this short account, Onondaga succeeds in his great plan to create a union of the five tribes. This involves years of wandering, first of all to the uh, east, to the Oneida tribe, where he is unsuccessful at um, getting support for his system, then on to the Mohawk tribe where he is adopted into the tribe and, and lives for a number of years, and finally a return to his own tribe, the Onondagas. And he finally defeats the terrible tyrant Tadodaho in an interesting way. Uh, the tyrant turns out to be become the head of the Confederacy. It's a brilliant piece of politics, it's, it's conquering the enemy by uh, co-opting the enemy, by making him, bringing him into the system. Now, this particular story allows us to explore the crucial relationship between history, what actually happened, and literature, that is later accounts of what happened. And uh, of course, this relationship between history and literature could be explored with, with hundreds of other literary works in many other cultures. Most people reading this brief account would, would question it as accurate history. Well, why? Well, for one thing, it, it has elements in it of what we would regard as fiction. First of all, uh, I think these, these uh, elements break down into two different kinds. First of all, the tyrant Tadodaho has a head of hair, the ends of which all terminate in living snakes. In fact, so do his fingers, his toes, his ears, his nose, lips, eyebrows, eyelashes. All of them end in living snakes. And this is, I think, clearly symbolic of the evil that he stands for. This is the man who eventually is made uh, the head of the Iroquois League in this particular story. The other f set of fictional elements have to do with the runners who are sent out. They take upon themselves the form of herons, and they fly west, uh, fly all the way to Sandusky, Ohio, and they don't find the council fire. And so a second group of runners is uh, sent out, and they take the form of crows, and, and they are successful. The whole uh, 
this whole mixture then of hi history and uh, literature is, is a fascinating one to explore. After all, we do know that the League uh, was formed, and there are many other accounts of it. They differ in detail, but they all have the same uh, principal characters, so it's, it's very clear that this is uh, uh, very much based on, on a real historical incident and probably involving these characters. But it's also clear that the fictional elements uh, vary from case to case. And, uh, and, and so this becomes a, an issue worth thinking about. First of all, let's point out the date of this particular account, which was, uh, it was set down in the year 1850. This happens to be about 400 years, four centuries, after the formation of the League. To be terribly precise, the, the League has been uh, dated by, uh, in the 19th century, it was dated by detailed research as uh, occurring in the year 1459. Of course, that's still a conjectural guess, but that's as close as, as we're able to come to the League. So when this particular account was set down, uh, this is 391 years later. And incidentally, it's, it's worth noting that by this time, the League had come and gone. Well, it was there uh, in rough outline. I mean, the chiefs still met, but the, the Iroquois nation had uh, pretty well been defeated by, in 1776 in the Revolutionary War. So here we are three quarters of a century later. But notice that the story has still survived orally. And it's worth also noting that the... Uh, the Iroquois Constitution that we, uh, we looked at in the last class, it also was first set down in writing about the same time, in the middle of the 19th century, also four centuries after the League was formed, which is to say that that Constitution had been carried in the heads of those uh, surviving members of the tribe all of that time. And uh, 400 years is a, is a long time. I mean, that's a different distance between Shakespeare's time and our own. And uh, through that whole time, the accounts of the origin of the League and, and the rules for the running of the League were carried simply as uh, stories and, and rules that were uh, remembered orally and passed on from generation to generation. And, and when these accounts were put down, we're already three, three quarters of a century after the major defeat of the League, and still these things are current and uh, well-remembered among the Iroquois people. So we have here a good example in this little account in the anthology of, of how myth and legend uh, works. First of all, the histor that historical events of great importance are the ones that last and get passed on presumably events of lesser importance that, that don't have great significance to people, may be told for a generation or two, but eventually they die out. Second, the very greatness of an event, its, its importance, leads to embellishment and enhancement in the telling. And over four centuries, uh, this, this is somewhere between 15 and 20 generations that the story is passed down from father and son. And, and while in most oral cultures there is a, a kind of social responsibility on the part of the storyteller to preserve the essence of the story as well as possible, still uh, there are going to be details that, that uh, creep into a story in, in all of those generations of telling which will gradually enhance it. Individual tellers will add their own personal touch. Uh, typically, in this sort of situation, characters take on mythic size and importance. They are not ordinary people, but extraordinary people, what we would call fictional or invented or imaginative elements are added to the account. Now today, we, we interpret these usually uh, as imaginative or symbolic details we have a sense that these things, these added details, are there and get added because the teller feels a need to enhance the story in some way. 
We usually avoid using words like fictional or invented, which of course suggests that such added details are lies. Uh, lies is, is a term that's used when we're dealing with supposedly factual accounts that look factual but in, in, in fact are not. Uh, we don't usually use the term lie in fiction. We talk about something imaginative. It's, it doesn't conform to the exact truth, but it's not a deliberate lie either. It's, it's an imaginative enhancement. Uh, well, as we look at this Iroquois story and, and try to interpret it, uh, this tyrant, Tadodaho, is, is all snaky. He's clearly a creature of mythic evil. He terrorizes, in the beginning of the story, he's terrorizing all the people and the other tribes. Symbolically, then, he embodies the ferocious um, war, uh, warlike character of, of these tribes before the League was formed. Their, their constant habit of forming raiding parties, of, of capturing people, of massacring, scalping, torturing. Uh, the Iroquois tribes, as I mentioned uh, in the last class, were known for being particularly ferocious, and the Mohawks particularly uh, were the most ferocious of all. And the Mohawks, there's an Indian name for the Mohawks, which is almost unpronounceable, but it means people of the flint, which refers to their weapons. But the, the word Mohawk is the term that they were more commonly known by, and Mohawk in the Iroquois language means literally man-eater. And that name thus does capture rather well uh, this kind of ferocious habits that these tribes had before the League was formed. The Confederacy brought an end to uh, all of these former terrors of war and, and so on. And um, thus we can sense that in, in the story where the hero of the story successfully manages to uh, I suppose, neutralize the evil of this tyrant, get him to shed his snaky um, appearance and, and become the head of the Confederacy, is in a sense uh, symbolic of what the League accomplished. It brought an end to this kind of terror and warfare that is symbolized in Tadodaho. In this way, then, oral stories carry the truth along, and sometimes they create metaphors for, for meaning. Uh, symbolic overtones of this kind capture larger truths. For the Iroquois, even after the Iroquois uh, Federation was gone, the league, league represented for them something important and great, a momentous point in their history, a time when good triumphed over evil. Uh, when a time when ordinary runners didn't simply run along the forest paths, uh, as we do today, but they, uh, they were very fast and flight and, and might in fact take on the, the, uh, take on the form of birds and uh, so on to fly through the sky. Note that this kind of interpretation, uh, in this kind of interpretation, what we do is we in interpret the added details as adding to the truth and adumbrating the truth of the original story by symbolic overtones. Now, we need to focus on exactly what's happening here because it not only lies at the very heart of a story like this, but it really lies at the heart of all stories. Uh, the details like uh, this tyrant snaky hair and the runners turning into birds. There are two attitudes that we can take. For us, standing outside of the culture, we can easily see that these are added imaginative details. But for the Iroquois, standing inside the culture, there's a different attitude involved here. Uh, typically, the Iroquois will treat these kinds of details with much more seriousness. It will not make the kind of distinction that we're making between uh, the original factual core and the added imaginative elements. In fact, he is certainly uh, not likely to admit or even believe that these are later added uh, 
elements to the original story. And this, here we have a, an important aspect of, of all oral stories, particularly those that are based on a historical event and passed down orally for a period of time. Um, first, the imaginative details are created and added to the original truth. But then, secondly, the tellers and the hearers of such stories tend to take both the original events and the added imaginative details as part of the whole truth of what happened. It is only a very, very objective person within a culture who is capable of, of separating the facts from the imaginative details. And there are many, many illustrations of this. Uh, we have no difficulty, for instance, looking at the pantheon of the Greek gods and, and some of the magical and mysterious things that they do in the old uh, Greek mythic stories, and we stand back objectively, and because we have a no emotional or religious commitment to these, we have no difficulty seeing these as imaginative stories. But if we take uh, one step out of the Hellenic culture into the Hebrew culture, and we start looking at the imaginative de details of, of the uh, Hebrew Christian tradition, then it's a whole different story, and um, people have a great deal of difficulty then making the separation between the historical core of events and what is clearly, to, to a, a student of literature, what is clearly uh, added imaginative details. It's a very uh, important and interesting issue, and it's one reason why a literary education is, is very important, because it helps to, to uh, learn those distinctions, particularly in belief systems, which always combine a historical nugget with added imaginative details. Of course, you can't get very far arguing with anybody about these details if they are committed uh, believer. Uh, you simply can't convince someone that those imaginative de details are later additions. Uh, the debate cannot be really resolved at that level. About the only thing you can do then is move to the psychological level and ask the question of what psychological need is being served by the addition of those imaginative details. And then it's, it's fairly clear that both the teller and the hearer uh, feels a great satisfaction in the stories from those imaginative details, so much satisfaction that they almost accept them as literal truth. Now, before we um, go on, a, um, a question came up in the last class. Um, let's put a quotation up here on the screen. Uh, I mentioned that Kanasatego, an Iroquois chief, was the first one ever to suggest that the 13 colonies ought to form a union. And uh, just to uh, talk a little bit more in detail about this, uh, the Iroquois chief uh, was, in fact, an Onondaga chief, and uh, the specific location was Pennsylvania. The, uh, there was a, an assembly that was being held between the Iroquois and the, uh, the British, and this was happening at the end of June and early July of 1744. And Specifically, uh, Kanasatego was frustrated in discussions. He came with a unified Iroquois position that had been worked out by the League. But he became very frustrated because he found himself in a three-way argument with commissioners from Virginia, Pennsylvania, and Maryland. And this, of course, keep in mind, is, is 30 years uh, before the Declaration of Independence and thus feeling things would work much better if the colonists had a structure that would unify the, this position, uh, Kanasatego delivered a speech, and it is rather ironic that this speech happened to have been delivered on July the 4th of 1744, 
This was exactly 32 years to the day before the Declaration of Independence and 43 years before the Constitution. And he said, we heartily recommend union and a good agreement between you, our English brethren. Our wise forefathers established union and amity between the five nations. This has made us formidable. This has given us great weight and authority with our neighboring nations. We are a powerful confederacy, and by your observing the same methods our wise forefathers have taken, you will acquire fresh strength and power. Very interesting uh, statement. And of course, Benjamin Franklin was present at that particular occasion. I mentioned that he became an advocate of the same idea through the next several years, in fact, was a, a champion of the Indians right through until the, uh, the signing of the Constitution. In the recording of Native American literature, uh, we could see that ethnocentric or what we could call Eurocentric uh, attitudes prevailed from the beginning. With few exceptions, uh, the recording of native oral literature did not occur until the uh, 19th and 20th century. Generally, no one was interested. This was simply because the Europeans generally had the idea that these people were, were savages and had little culture and little religion, and so they, they were barbarians and not worth paying any attention to. There is, however, one notable exception to this, and this is uh, Roger Williams. Now, uh, Roger Williams is represented in the Heath Anthology, a fair chunk of him, actually. I have not assigned him on the course, but I think it behooves you to take a few minutes and find him. He's in around page uh, 268. 270 and have a look there are excerpts there from his book a key into the language of America and uh, let me put that that title up on the screen uh, a key into the language of America 1643 this is very early um, uh, Williams actually came out to America in the Great Migration to Massachusetts Bay in 1630 and became immediately interested in the, in the uh, Indians. He, he got into a lot of trouble, too, uh, with the uh, Puritans because his views flew in the face of accepted opinion. But within 13 years, he had done enough study of the Indians to write this particular uh, work. Williams was the most highly educated uh, man of his day. Uh, he had had an apprenticeship with, um, with Sir Edward Coke in England, who was one of the great jurists of, of the time. And uh, he also got a theological education. But the interesting thing is that his legal, he brought his legal opinions then with him in 1630 to New England. And uh, this affected his view of the American Indians and the role that the, particularly the Narragansett Indians um, had with the colonies. The position he took on the Indians eventually got him into hot water with the Puritan authorities. He had to flee to avoid banishment. He fled south of Boston to a Narragansett Indian community uh, down in the area of what is now Rhode Island. And he created a new colony at Providence, what is now Providence, the city of Providence, Rhode Island. Now, his opinion grew directly from his legal opinion. And here it is in a nutshell. He argued that the king of England had no right to give American lands to the settlers. Why? Because the land wasn't the king's to give. Now, it's interesting that Roger Williams' position was absolutely legal within the English system. They still didn't listen to him, but it was absolutely legal within the English legal system. 
And here it is in essence. To give or grant or sell land, one must first have clear title establishing ownership. The same thing holds today. If you buy, or, or buy a house, one of the things you want is clear title. You want to know that it is free of encumbrances. You want to know that there isn't somebody that, that owned this land 100 years ago whose descendants are going to come and, and lay claim to it. In fact, you buy title insurance for precisely that purpose, to search the deeds and make sure that the title is clear. He said the English did not have clear title to the American lands. Clear title, he said, requires a deed in which the earlier holders of the land, that is, the Native Americans, actually signed over to the king and surrendered all rights to the land. And of course, the king of England, none of the kings of, of England or Spain or, or any of the colonizing uh, countries ever did that. Um, it seemed like an absurd idea to the Puritans, and this was one of the why, ways, one of the reasons why they rejected him. In fact, uh, William Bradford, who we'll look at in a, in a few days, one of the major Puritan writers, said that Roger Williams was very unsettled in judgment. And John Winthrop went further. He said w Williams had diverse, new, and dangerous opinions. So you can see the Eurocentric attitudes operating here. In any event, when Williams fled, he, he went to the, the Narragansett Indians, and he did what he advocated. He negotiated with the Indians. He got them to agree on a, a piece of land for his colony. And then he got them to, he created the deed which, in which they deeded over the land to him, giving him perpetual ownership of the land. And then, just to be sure, he sailed to England and got a charter from the king, just so that he covered himself both ways. In his, uh, in his day, Williams was uh, vilified. The colony at Providence, Rhode Island, then collected all sorts of dissenters and Hutchison, for instance, fled there. Anybody who didn't agree with the Puritans was in danger. They fled to Providence, Rhode Island. It became a kind of dissenting community. Some people called it Rogue's Island instead of Rhode Island. And uh, this, this particular colony then collected Quakers and Jews and Ann Hutchison and, and uh, many other people. Um, the work, A Key into the Language of America, which is the first study of Native American language and culture, was based on the Narragansett Indians that, uh, that Roger Williams dealt with in Rhode Island. In addition, it described in detail Native American culture, their food, their family practices, their clothing, their family relationships, their trade, their hunting and fishing lifestyle, their ideas about war, even their religious beliefs. And uh, this work, uh, a key into the language of America, became the first to take a sympathetic look at Indian culture and ways. He, of course, did point out the, the prejudicial language that the colonists used. For instance, uh, he points out that that when the English want to refer to the Native Americans, the words they use are natives, savages, Indians, wild men, and that the Dutch called them pagans, barbarians, heathen. That's on page 270 in the anthology. Uh, and of course, pagans and heathen are specifically uh, terms of religious rejection since these uh, Native Americans were not Christians, therefore uh, they were classified in the typical way that one would expect in the uh, 17th century as pagans and uh, heathens. And it's in, this is very interesting work because uh, Williams, even at this early date, clearly uh, understood the, the terrible tragic effects that European uh, colonization was having uh, on the Native Americans. Well, as I've indicated, the, 
the recording of Native American stories actually uh, began about 200 years later in the 19th century. There were, um, there were of course, people that were interested. Uh, we've already looked at a, an item from this book on the course. Uh, let me just show you the book on the screen. Um, this is uh, Codwallader uh, Colden's book, The History of the Five Indian Nations, uh, written in 1727. And uh, the readings in the, uh, the documents pamphlet, the very first reading is the brief little preface to, uh, to that work. This, this work um, runs uh, to about 180 pages, and, and as you can see, it's in a, uh, a contemporary uh, paperback. The first big study of the League itself is this book. Um, by uh, Lewis Henry Morgan, um, the League of the Iroquois, and there's his name. And this, this book actually uh, stands as uh, the authoritative book on the League. This was written in 1851. And as you can see with this, this is a fairly hefty book, but it's a new edition. This book is in print. Um, he was a very... Uh, uh, a very good um, ethnographer, and a lot of the information we have on the League uh, comes from this book. Uh, this, this runs to uh, 350 or so pages, and then it has a large supplementary section, too. Uh, so you can see that, that there was interest, some interest in the 18th century, and this, this book by Lewis Henry Morgan the League of the Iroquois probably signals the real beginning of intense interest in the Native Americans. Uh, now let's be, let's be clear about the term literature. There is in the term literature a cultural bias. And we need to be very clear on this from the beginning. Let's look at this word literature on the screen. Here are the, the uh, Latin origins of this word. Uh, litera, the noun, uh, means a letter. That is not a letter that you'd write to a friend, but an individual letter of the alphabet. It also means handwriting. In the plural, literae, it means literature. The adverb literati means in clear letters or in clear plain writing and the Latin word literatura means lettered writing. These, these are the Latin words that lie behind our, our word literature. Now this means that the term literature implies in, in English the term literature implies something written. And here we can see a, a real um, cultural bias. Alphabetic writing really only begins about 1000 BC, which added, uh, added up means that we've had written literary works, uh, when we count the very earliest ones, only for about 3000 years. Yet the uh, and this is an unfortunate Eurocentric bias, and, and it is what has colored the, uh, the study of literature ever since. Um, the position here that we're taking is that because the, this word has a built-in bias, we, we simply should try to leap past that bias and recognize that literature, uh, literature can include oral narrative too. The, and this position has some logic to it. Linguists are convinced for a lot of reasons that are really too complicated to go into here, but that humans have had a fairly well-developed language for as long as 200,000 years. That would certainly include oral storytelling, at least for a substantial portion of that time. It's almost inconceivable to imagine a language of communication without there also being um, the ability to tell stories. 
For that matter, as soon as you actually say what you did yesterday, you know, you come home and, you know, 100,000 years ago, you, you've been out yesterday, you come home, you've seen something, um, how are you going to send members of your tribe to, to, to go down into the valley where there's a bison herd to hunt if you can't tell a story? Yesterday down in the valley I saw it. I mean, that's the beginning of a story. So uh, even if we pick a, a figure of, of, say, half that time of about 100,000 years of storytelling, that still means that written literature of only the last 3,000 3, years represents a very, very small portion of, uh, of human storytelling. Of course, the other side of it is that we, we don't have those oral stories from the earlier period. But what we do have to recognize is that there's a great deal of importance that should be laid at, upon what oral stories do actually, uh, actually remain. Uh, let me give you some examples of oral literature that you may not actually been aware of uh, here on the screen. Um, the historical fall of Troy, for instance, occurred about the year 1250 BC. It's been excavated and, and dated. Homer's Iliad and Odyssey, which is the earliest written account of the stories of Troy, was put into writing in the 8th century BC. The earliest, the 8th century would mean between 800 and 700 BC. Let's take the earliest of those, 800, just, just for a sample. This means that the stories of the fall of Troy existed only in oral form for 450 years before somebody decided to put these down into this, with this newfangled system that had been developed, alphabetic writing. Or the English stories of King Arthur. The details of the King Arthur stories date those stories to the 5th century AD. The written stories of King Arthur, the earliest written stories of King Arthur, date to the 12th century AD. Where were the stories of Arthur in the interim? For 700 years, those stories were oral traditions passed down. Thirdly, from internal evidence plus archaeological evidence, we can date this, the stories of Abraham, for instance, which begin about the 11th chapter of the book of Genesis to the, around the year 1850 B.C., we can date the Moses stories to around 1250 B.C., those stories that are in the book of Exodus. These stories were put into written form for the first time around 1000 B.C. This means that the stories of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob existed in oral form only for 850 years, and the Moses story existed in oral form for 250 years before it achieved its present written form. These are examples, and we can actually go to the early, liter early literature of almost every culture the French, the Spanish, the Indian subcontinent, the Chinese, and we find the same thing. In fact, there's even been studies of how you can detect an oral tradition in those early written literary documents. So the same sort of thing that we've seen, the, what we've talked about, imaginative enhancement that we've seen in this Iroquois story of the formation of the League, set down 450 years after the events, the same kind of imaginative enhancement um, exists in all of, these, all of these accounts. And you can see again why a, um, a literary education is very important for sorting out these things. I would say particularly in the case of the, uh, the biblical tradition, which lies, of course, at the heart of, of uh, the principal religion of uh, the Western world today. Now, any story creates a, what we could call a separate reality. 
And I want to talk a little bit about this because it's at the very heart of, of how stories work. If we read novels, we know this. A, a, a novel creates a fictional world, a separate fictional reality with imaginary people. The worlds of uh, Huckleberry Finn or Scarlett O'Hara are good examples. These don't exist in real life. They are a separate fictional reality created by the writer, by the words on the page. And this is a central idea to under our understanding of what literature is. And it's, it's, um, it's central to understanding of both language and literature. And we need to grasp this to try to clear out a lot of, of confusions. No, Native American literature here, of course, is no different from any other early literature. Uh, now, I prefer the term separate reality because it doesn't have any bias in it of truth or falsity. But it, I think it does illustrate um, very well uh, what we're talking about. Let's, to look at this, let's begin with three very common uses of words here on the screen. Uh, these are, and, and we'll illustrate each of these. First of all, we have what we could call a labeling use of words. Secondly, a referential use of words. And thirdly, an imaginative use of words. Now, this is, this is simplified. There's, there's a lot of complex details here, but I think this will get us started. Let's look at the first of these, the labeling use of words. Here, words are used as labels for things actually present when the words are spoken. Look, there is Gankwa paddling a canoe. One person speaking to another, pointing, pointing down the hill to the river and saying, there is Gankwa paddling a canoe. The words Gankwa, the name, the canoe, the paddling, they are used in the presence of real things or events they signify. If I say, here is a table, here is a book, here, my name is, I'm using language in that labeling sense, things present. And this is a basic use of language. It shows words connected to things and events. It's how we teach children. You know, we point to objects and we attach words to them. The second use of words is what we could call the referential use of words. This is words referring to things not present. Yesterday, I saw Ganqua paddling a canoe. Now, when these words are spoken, the, the Ganqua is not within sight, the canoe is not within sight, and the paddling occurred yesterday. In other words, there is a separation between the words and the reality that they signify. In this case, it's a, a, a separation in time. Um, it can be a separation in space. It's, it's a combination of space and time separation between the words. And it usually has to do with uh, when something is in the past, but, uh, but it can refer to the future. If you say, I'm going shopping for milk and bread tomorrow, uh, there's a separation between the words. The words are signifying things that, that are not present to you. And you notice that this use of words requires that the speaker and the hearer uh, agree on a vocabulary. That is, they both have to be speakers of the language because they don't have the objects to point to. This, of course, is the most useful of all forms of language use because almost all of our uh, daily activities involve this. This allows us to uh, tell someone what we did yesterday or what we're going to do tomorrow and, and extend it out to society. This allows us to write history. It allows us to make plans, to plan a pure personal future. It allows a nation to plan a budget. Uh, it allows us to give directions. It allows um, uh, someone to bake a cake or, or assemble a piece of furniture. And it is what we use to talk about the structure of reality. If you're in a classroom uh, studying sociology, the structure of society, or 
or mechanics of materials in engineering or whatever, you're using this form of language. You're talking about things which aren't present to you, but because of an agreed upon vocabulary, you can uh, communicate. Now, it's important to realize that, that these words create a separate reality. Yesterday I saw Gankwa paddling a canoe. Uh, in the mind of the speaker, they're recalling an image of yesterday, and in the mind of the hearer, they have an image created with these words. And that, that picture in their mind is a kind of separate reality. It's a reality created by the words. And a, 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 a book, a, a novel, creates a separate reality of this kind that is peopled with characters in a specific time and place that are doing certain things. But it's a separate reality in the sense that it doesn't exist. It exists only in the mind of the hearer. Now, suppose we use words without either pointing to reality or referring to it. Words, perhaps, that are not about reality at all. Then we have a story. We have created a separate reality that is not connected to anything that is real, either real present to us or even real or present in the past. Now, the words may appear to connect with reality because all of our words originated with real things. <coughs> but, in fact, we've, we have a, a separate reality here of a rather unusual kind. Let's look at the... Um, Seneca story, the origin of, uh, the origin of uh, stories, on the screen here's the opening of that. This is what we would call the imaginative use of words. Now at first, you can't really tell that this is imaginative. This could be a piece of referential writing, referring to something that really happened. There was once a boy, this boy could have been, I mean yesterday, last week, last year. There's no indication that this is invented. There was once a boy who had no home. His parents were dead and his uncles would not care for him. In order to, to live, this boy, whose name was Gakwa or Crow, made a, a bower of branches and hunted birds and squirrels for food. He had almost no clothing but was very ragged and dirty. The people laughed, holding their noses, which made him feel heavy-hearted. He resolved to go away. Now, we, have, we sense that this is a story, but you'll notice in the words that you can't tell. And that's one of the interesting things about the imaginative use of language. You can't tell whether it's about reality in a referential sense or whether it's purely made up. But look what happens in the next paragraph. We are suddenly, we suddenly get the message in this paragraph, and this is why I put a box around it that we are now in an imaginative reality. The boxed paragraph is the clue. One night, Gakwa found a canoe. Stepping in, he grasped the paddle. When the canoe immediately shot into the air and he paddled above the clouds and under the moon. Finally, the canoe dropped into a river and then Gakwa paddled for shore. Now let's just read the last four lines here, uh, and then we'll come back to that boxed paragraph. On the other side of the river was a great cliff that had a face that looked like a man. The boy resolved to make his home on the top of the cliff. That paragraph at the bottom, too, is, is clearly, um, uh, it could be referential writing. The fact that, that a, a cliff had a sort of marking on it, maybe in the cracks or crevices that looked like a face, that's something that could be real. It's like looking at the moon and seeing a face. But that paragraph that's boxed is clearly of a different order in language, and we would call that the imaginative use of language. And the clearest signal is that events are occurring in there, the canoe paddling over the clouds, that don't happen in the ordinary world. And that's the clue that tells us this is imaginative writing. Here, a Gakwa and the canoe and the paddling and so on have no reference to a real person, a real canoe, a real sky, or anything else, or any real event. What's happened here is words which began as labels for things have moved out even past the referential into a completely separate reality where they signify nothing in the real world. They are used to create a separate reality in the mind of the reader. 
And this is one of the most unusual qualities of language. Now, th this is a, a, um, a, a great power. Uh, there's a great power here in, in words. But let's look at the, um, the next part of the story. And we will see here that, again, we can't be sure. This could be referential writing. Probably it's not, because that earlier paragraph about him paddling in the sky tells us this is probably imaginative. But look at this language. This illustrates the story's mix writing that looks referential with writing that is clearly imaginative. The first night he sat on the edge of the cliff, he heard a voice saying, give me some tobacco. Well, that could be a real experience. I mean, a friend, somebody could be hiding out in the bushes in the dark and saying that. Looking around, the boy, seeing no one, replied, why should I give tobacco? So he's playing a bit of a game here. There was no answer, and the boy began to fix his arrows. After a while, the voice spoke again, give me some tobacco. Again, this could be somebody hiding in the bush, simply repeating themselves. Gakwa now took out some tobacco and threw it over the cliff. The voice spoke again. Now I will tell you a story. And at this point, we start to move back into an imaginative reality. And as this goes on in the next paragraph, we are clearly in an imaginative world. Feeling greatly awed, the boy listened to a story that seemed to come directly out of the rock upon which he was sitting. Finally, the voice paused, for the story had ended. Then it spoke again, saying, It shall be the custom hereafter to present me with a small gift for my stories. Um, so, uh, this, again, we're back into the imaginative. And this, the, if you're looking at the text of a story, almost always you have this mixture of something that could be real and yet something that is fictional. In fact, the typical reader of novels, for instance, prefers something that has that mix. People who read, let's say, um, popular fiction, crime stories, or, or so on, what they like is that this is, this is placed in New York or London or some place that they know, that the events are believable, that it's about something that happens in the everyday world like crime. At the same time, the hero or main characters are made up and invented. And that particular mix of, of an invented story, but that nevertheless looks like it's referential, referring to something that could happen, seems to be the most popular kind of, of, uh, of story for most people. Now, what's going on in this particular story? When we come to interpretation, uh, I think a literary interpreter would have to say that the Seneca, this is a Seneca story, um, the Senecas seemed to believe that the origin of stories was a mysterious thing. And in fact, even people who write stories will, will say, you know, I don't know how it happens, it just sort of comes to me. Uh, so even a modern hard-nosed uh, citizen of the 20th century does have a sense that the whole process of, of creating a story is a mysterious, uh, a mysterious process. So would someone who writes music or, or does painting. They don't really understand how they do it. It is mysterious. This story uh, captures that by suggesting that these stories were first spoken from a cliff to the boy. Um, and of course, there's another function, uh, another thing that's going on here. Uh, in the Seneca region somewhere, we can be reasonably sure that there is a rock outcropping or a cliff where if you looked at it, uh, you could imagine a face. Just like as we look at, uh, as we look at the moon, we can um, see a face in it. Uh, quite often we see natural features and we'll say, well, it looks like a horse's head. You can look up at the clouds and, and think you see an animal or something. This is a very common experience. Uh, for the, in this story, what we have is 
a kind of explanation for the, the head look of this particular cliff. And it, it thus connects into the story rather well. The cliff turns out to be a mysterious, almost supernatural cliff. cliff. The, um, the separate reality of this story then, uh, what is created is a kind of realm beyond the ordinary realm from which certain things come. And if you follow this so far, you'll recognize that, that it's words that create a separate reality. But once the separate reality is created in language, then it's very hard to get rid of it. It's very hard not to believe that it's there. And in, in a particular culture, a separate reality that is created in stories is believed rather literally by the adherents to that culture. Um, for, of course, uh, people will, will per put forth all kinds of other arguments for why that separate reality actually, truly, really does exist. But uh, such arguments go beyond the methodology of literature and linguistics. From a, a literary or, or language uh, point of view, the separate reality is in fact a product of words. The very creation of a word uh, as a label, which can then be used when the object isn't present, present, that in itself creates a separate reality, a verbal reality. Then if that collection of words is used apart from the objects to create a separate reality that, that, that tells a story, um, the, the, the uh, logical sort of progression of, of thinking here is that the separate reality has some kind of reality in and for itself uh, alongside the real world from which the word sprung. And I think that something like this is, is probably behind uh, almost all beliefs in a separate reality that, uh, that we find throughout world, um, world cultures. One other detail in this story I think that's interesting, the boy in the story is homeless, he has no parents, he is an outcast, and uh, there is a kind of long tradition in, in literature that, uh, that often it is the lonely character of, of this kind who is an outcast who ends up uh, being the, the storyteller. Uh, it is that sort of person who turns out to have the, the magic, the, uh, the gift, and so on. Now, we're not immune from this. Uh, I mean, a good example... Uh, People today say, well, how did you get that story? How did you come up with that idea? They say, oh, it was kind of inspiration. Inspiration. Well, the word inspiration is a separate reality. It creates a separate reality. The, the root of that word is spiritus, which means wind or breath or spirit. And inspiration literally means the taking in of a spirit from outside. Um, there you can see that the word itself has created a separate reality of spirit, which thou is called the source of inspiration. In fact, uh, I think that's a great example of the, the way in which words themselves do embody a separate reality often in their meanings. And once you've, uh, once you've learned a word that, that implies a separate reality of that kind, then it's virtually impossible psychologically to do away with it. Try to deny that that, that that spiritual reality that is the cause of the inspiration is not there, that is sure, purely a product of the words, and you're going to have a very difficult philosophical problem on your hands. Not to mention a, a big debate if you try to discuss it with someone. Um, Notice that the boy in the story uh, meets a girl and she makes a pouch for him. The gift of the pouch is simply a cultural element from the Seneca. It, it is uh, likely an act of, that is connected with uh, betrothment. But the, and, and it, of course it signifies approval of the boy. And given his earlier 
position as an outcast in the society, this, this is an integrating experience where now he is brought back into the uh, society, into a normal life, he's accepted into a family. In other words, by becoming the source of stories, uh, he moves from being a previous outcast to, to being a, a true member of society, and the pouch that she's given him then becomes the container of his stories. You notice how stories, which we would regard as rather nebulous things, are here made concrete as if they can be possessed like, like stones or objects and stored in a pouch. Again, we see a kind of symbolizing process operating here. The, um, the uh, story has an element of heroism, too, because uh, by doing something, by accomplishing something great, by becoming himself the source of stories, this boy has proved his heroic stature and thus earns the right to his bride. Now, we have another interesting story Native American story in Wopi and the Gift of the Pipe, which is a Lakota story in the text. And the Lakota people are people of the Dakotas, North and South Dakota. Now, like the previous story, this story at first appears to be a story using words in their referential function. We have these two young men uh, who are out, you know, lying around on the rocks looking at the sky, and they see a figure approaching, and as this figure gets closer, it turns out to be a young, a young woman with, with wearing no clothes, whatever, but with long hair. And um, while this is on the borderline of, of likelihood, it, it, it could happen, we do sense that maybe it, it didn't, that we're in a realm of story. Uh, the use of words, however, shifts from that referential use of words, recounting a, an event that could have happened. It shifts to the purely imaginative towards the end of the first paragraph. One of the boys goes out and tries to embrace her. They are wrapped in cloud, and when the cloud goes away, the second boy sees that his friend has disappeared. And in fact, his friend has, has, is nothing, there's nothing left of him but a, a pile of bones. So we are clearly here in a separate reality because this is a world where uh, things are happening that, that we really wouldn't expect to happen in the real world. The story recounts the, uh, the, the use, how the use of the pipe came to the Lakotas. Uh, now, what, what we can conjecture is that the Lakota men of the tribe uh, smoke when certain central rituals are occurring. Of course, this is a relaxing sort of social thing to do. Uh, but they have discovered in moments of smoking their pipe that they feel as if there is something spiritual present. And, uh, uh, that there's something perhaps with sacred power. And the fact that they smoke in certain kinds of ritual situations adds to that feeling that there's something present. The feeling is attached to the smoke of the pipe because of the way smoke acts. Perhaps it wafts in the air and it, it's there and then it disappears. If you reach out and try to grasp but you cannot. So the smoke becomes a good symbol for wakan in the story, W-A-K-A-N, which is the uh, Lakota word for spiritual power. And uh, it is around such things as the use of the pipe, the sacred pipe, that mythic stories are likely to cluster. And this story is about the origin of the use of the pipe. The, uh, the girl, uh, finally gives her, she, she turns out to be an embodiment of spirit, of Wakan, and she stays with the tribe for a while, and then she leaves, and um, she leaves behind a permanent presence in the use of the pipe, and says, in effect, that whenever uh, you smoke the pipe and the, and the smoke is there, I am present. Um, a story like this, 
which tells of the origins of something, an origin of a ritual, has a particular kind of name. And uh, let's put this on the screen. These are words that perhaps you, uh, you should know. Etiology is the science of causes or the science of origins. It's a word of, of Greek derivation. An etiological story is a story explaining or accounting for the origins of something, a custom, a practice, a ritual, and a great number of uh, myths and stories are etiological. When, for instance, you read in, in the book of Genesis, a story that's very well known in our culture, uh, about um, how after Adam and Eve uh, sinned by eating the fruit of the forbidden tree, uh, Eve is given uh, punishment in the form of pain in childbirth. She is punished for her sin. This is an etiological story. It is an etiological myth explaining why women have pain in childbirth. A little further along in Genesis, you read about a tower that men tried to build to heaven. Uh, God was not happy about this, and so he confounded the work project by giving every one of the men on the, working on the tower a different language. They were no longer able to communicate, no longer able to uh, do a job together, and so the building of the tower came to a stop. This is an etiological story which recounts the origin of all the world's languages. There are many, many examples. Most mythologies, Greek mythology and so on, is littered with hundreds of examples. And it's one of the most common um, kinds of story that we, that we find. And stories about power, energy, spirit, um, all things that seem real but are in fact invisible, these typically resort to symbols of these. The, 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 the girl in the Lakota story who symbolizes Wakan. Uh, uh, gods in Greek mythology who, who symbolize valor or uh, uh, like Athena, she symbolizes wisdom. Uh, Aphrodite, she symbolizes love. Uh, it's very difficult to conceptualize abstract things, and so in mythology they, they typically get deified or uh, we get a, a kind of symbol for them. And it's usually, of course, something drawn from, from uh, culture. If it's a warrior culture, you're going to get warrior gods. If it's an agricultural culture, you may get corn gods. In, very common in Indian mythology to have corn gods or wind gods. And if animals are particularly important, it's a hunting culture, you're very likely to get hunting or animal gods. Uh, it's interesting that in this story, she is a mediator between earth and sky, Wopi is, and uh, she's associated with meteors and falling stars. Why? Well, of course, meteors and falling stars come down out of the sky to Earth. They mediate, in a sense, between sky and Earth. An interesting connection here in Roman mythology, the mediator between Earth and sky is the messenger god, and that's Mercury. Uh, messengers move very fast. They have to, you know, like Federal Express. Mercury is a very fast planet. It's the closest one to the sun. It has an orbit of 88 days. So Mercury is the messenger and the mediator between Earth and sky. A very uh, fast young man indeed. Um, now when we move to this story uh, about changing woman, the Navajo story, let's put this on the screen. Uh, we, the opening paragraph here tells us immediately that we are in what I've called a separate reality, an imaginative story. We don't have any paragraphs at the beginning that look referential at all. We're right into it here, and this story is clearly imaginative from beginning to end. The Navajos found on the ground a small turquoise, ima turquoise image of a woman. That, I suppose, could be referential. Someone finds something on the ground. This they preserved 
Of late, the monsters had been actively pursuing and devouring the people, and at the same time, there were only four persons remaining alive, an old man and a woman and their two children. Well, the whole setting here of monsters devouring people and only four people left on Earth, this is clearly an imaginative situation. And this story, if you've followed it through, um, is, is uh, purely in a separate realm. It is purely in a separate reality that is, that is created by uh, these words. Here is uh, the next paragraph in that uh, story, uh, somewhat abbreviated here. Two days later, they heard the voice of talking God. After a while, the call was repeated a second time. A third, the fourth call was loud and clear. As soon as it ceased, the shuffling tread of moccasined feet was heard, and talking God stood before them. Um, as soon as you get monsters, as you do in that first paragraph, or a talking God here, uh, you're, you're, as I say, clearly in an imaginative, imagined world. The words are not being used uh, as labels for something present. They're not being used referentially for something that was present yesterday. They're being used totally imaginatively for something that is not present, but is created by the words themselves. Notice, however, that it's very difficult for people ever to uh, imagine or create gods that are not like their own people. Here, uh, there's a beautiful phrase, the shuffling tread of moccasined feet was heard and talking God stood before them. Gods always do tend uh, to have the qualities of, of the human beings who have uh, created them. This is a confusing story at first. The rapid change of characters, uh, first we've got four people who haven't been eaten yet, they're summoned to a mountain, they're surrounded by a whole pantheon of, of gods and spiritual people. Then the I image of the turquoise woman that they found is laid on a piece of buckskin along with um, a shell woman image, side by side, they're covered over with buckskin. Um, a few minutes later the buckskin is taken off, a magic transformation has occurred and now we have changing woman and white shell woman real living hu uh, beings. Then they, the, the original people are shuffled off the stage and these two new uh, miraculously created living beings take over the story. They are miraculous, we have a miraculous conception, the sunlight fertilizes one of them, uh, falling water fertilizes the other. Twins are born and then the sons grow up in a matter of mere days and then their question is, uh, who's our father? And the story becomes a quest story where they go out and try to find their father. Of course, through the whole story, uh, they are in danger of being caught by the monsters who are ravaging the, um, the landscape. And one particular um, monster man called Yatso is particularly dangerous. Uh, he is probably a drought spirit because you see him in one scene drinking the water out of the lakes and virtually drinking them dry. So you can see the connection between drought and evil monsters devouring the land. When you do have extended drought, you're going to have hunger, you may have starvation, you may have a lot of people die. That's probably, uh, probably the connection. You also have other natural enemies. You have reeds that cut people to, po uh, to pieces, uh, cactuses that tear their skin, burning sands, which would probably refer to the desert regions around the Navajo country, which was New Mexico and, and, um, and Arizona. Uh, so there's a lot of local cultural elements in the story. Eventually they are successful and they do become uh, monster slayers. Uh, when the god is killed, his armor splinters, and this is an etiological story explaining why you can go all through Navajo land and pick up pieces of flint. I guess that's an actual fact. There's flint all over the place for making arrowheads. It's a creation story, a story about the origins of the people. Uh, it's the origins of a mountain that looks like a head. 
It is the origin of a strange lava flow, which is said to be the congealed blood of the, uh, of the fallen monster. So you see you have cultural elements in the moccasin feet of the god, you have natural elements in the reeds, the cactus, and so on, and uh, you have etiological elements explaining certain mountains and natural lava flows. Well, have a good day.